Although she's a Tony-winning Broadway star, Tanya Pinkins is not one to rest on her laurels. These days, the true stage powerhouse is hard at work on Red Pill, a horror film of the moment that she wrote, directed, and even stars in. Her resume is packed with fan-favorite shows. Merrily We Roll Along, The Wild Party, Jelly's Last Jam, and of course, Caroline or Change, to name a few. Hear how Pinkins became the multi-hyphenate artist she is today, why 2020 gave her creativity a surprising boost, and more on this week's Show People. Miss Tanya Pinkins, good to see you. Good to see you. Before we even start, I have to say... It's just me and you here, but we're both Geminis, so there might be a lot of people in this room. Exactly. When's your birthday? I'm, I, I, I'm May 29. Oh, and I'm May 30th. When I'm in the last minutes of my birthday every year, you know, grasping for like, you know, this is me day, then you're just starting. So we, we, we yes. like butt up against each other. So I'm going to think of you now every year. A- and that's actually where we are right now, because it's the end of your day in New York and the beginning of my day in Korea. That's right. What what the heck are you doing in Korea, Tanya Pinkins? I am over here in Korea because I'm obsessed with Korean storytelling. I love, I mean, I've been obsessed with it before everybody discovered Bong Joon-ho. I owned Mother a decade ago. And um, Minji Kong is this amazing uh, young filmmaker who uh-huh. liked my, my, my script for Red Pill. And um, she and I d- decided she would cut my film and because they have COVID under control, only 500 people have died out of 50 million. Wow. I flew here because we could sit side by side and cut. And as you know, as you've been editing, it is very difficult to cut a film remotely. Yeah. So this is exciting. You're making a movie. When I first heard you were doing this, I was like, okay, I, you know, I love when people find, <laughs> find new paths, new creative outlets. Uh, the trailer you released was incredible. Um, <laughs> How long have you been there and how are you feeling? Do you feel like really immersed in it? Um, We are very close to picture lock. uh, So we're getting ready to start turnovers to Paul Sue, who's doing my sound design and T Skoll, who is composing. So it's actually Julie Taymor's entire sound team is doing my post sound. And my cast is all these Broadway people, um, Ruben Blades and Luba Mason, Adeshala Osakalumi from Fela and Catherine Curtin and Kathy Irby. So it was great to work with all these theater people because I didn't have any money and I didn't have any time. And I could literally go, we're gonna shoot this like it's a it's a it's a scene in a play. So just like we're gonna shoot all 10, 10 pages, just go. <laughs> you were sort of inspired by a visit to a friend's house, right? She has this house that she always invites me to come up and have as a writing retreat. And it's, you know, it's on one of those single lane streets where there's the church and the post office and the pond is in the back. And I was like, you know, this is this is a house where, where horror films happen. <laughs> and she was like, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's terrifying actually. Do you consider yourself like a city person? Do you consider yourself like a New York City? I will never consider myself a New York City person, but I have lived in New York City more than half of my life. But I think that when you are a Midwesterner, you are always a Midwesterner. There's certain manners and directness Uh that you have as a Midwesterner that I always say about New Yorkers, they may be brush, you know, brush you off, gruff, but they are not honest and they take offense with someone being direct and honest with them, which Mm -hmm. is a very Midwestern thing. Mm -hmm. That is true. That's absolutely true. All my family's (laughs) from the Midwest. I know that I know the difference, but I also have to say that I live uh, in the Catskills now because of, because of COVID and it took me a long time to get used to the dark at night and to get used Mm -hmm. to the space and the quiet. And that's sort of the stuff you're talking about. That's the stuff of horror movies, you know, Exactly. I'm glad it inspires something in you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I like trees uh-huh. and I own land in the Ozarks and I, and I often, I go there a couple of, you know, once a year and try to just do kind of silent retreat. And last year when I was there, um, I guess I hadn't been at that specific time of the year. The crickets were so loud that I had to wear earplugs. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's like, no, the woods are not silent. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So this movie, uh, 
very of the moment. You're dealing with the political landscape. Your movie, it's set before the election, right? It's actually set the weekend of the election. It starts on Halloween, yeah. It's definitely a ripe landscape to add a genre like horror to. How do you think people are gonna react to it? You got a lot of reaction to the teaser you put out, right? Yeah, we had thought we'd have it out in March. Um, we had uh -huh. a screening set at the uh, Museum of the Moving Image and, you know, COVID hit and, yeah. you know, remote editing was very complicated. If it had come out in March, I think it would have been easy for it to be dismissed because so much of what I wrote about in my story was not yet in the zeitgeist. Sometimes it feels like, well, that has to come out during this time period, but maybe a little distance will actually give it even more impact. I hope so, because I, I you know, there's... I like humor in my horror, so there's a lot of places that I'm I'm kind of laughing through the whole movie, but I think for some people it'll just be terrifying, which is kind of how people felt about Get Out. Like I was dating yeah. a British guy at the time, and he it was a horror movie from him, and I was laughing through the whole thing. <laughs> so I I I I, I said to my uh, producers, I said we want people to both love it and hate it. That's the best. If they don't care or they dismiss it, that's not good. Love and uh -huh. hate. You want uh -huh. strong emotions. I agree. That's always my favorite things are always love or hate things. So mm -hmm. were, you, were you attracted to horror as a kid or as a teen? Is that like, is that a genre that got you? It is. It's yeah. like, it's how I, it's my bedtime story. Like I'll watch a horror movie and then it like relaxes me. But I will say that up until probably my thirties, my imagination was so active that I would like, imagine what I saw in the movies in real life. So um, that was a bit of a deterrent, but I still love them and I still went. And now my daughter and I, cause I, I, I started all of my four kids on horror. We will sometimes just spend a day and watch four or five horror movies in a day. What are some of your go-to horror movies? I love the original Halloween cause you never see anyone get killed. I love Nightmare on Elm Street. Dreamweavers, the third one in that sequence. Uh -huh. I love the um, Clue Gallagher return of the living dead because that is both terrifying and funny. And for me in that when the people do what you would want them to do rather than like, don't do that stupid thing. So those are like three of my tops that I own. And then in the in the South Korean world, um, I love Mother, which is Bong Joon-ho, early, early Bong Joon-ho. And there's this Korean movie, Bedeviled that wow. I've watched four or five times. It is a complete, uh, just shatters Aristotelian story structure, and I love it. I remember when that, that Nightmare on Elm Street, the third one came out, that, that messed me up as a kid. That, that, that really scared me. You just brought back some terrifying <laughs> memory. Thank you for that. And um, you're up there in the cat skills. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> My dog will protect me. Uh, from Freddy Krueger. The dog our race <laughs> always goes early. <laughs> so people that knew you uh, up until this moment, would they not be surprised that you have taken this turn and that you're a filmmaker? It's exciting that, that you've sort of found this whole other path. I feel like I'm always surprising myself, but I find that people around me um, are always like, yeah, well, you're always doing something that nobody would be doing. So now my friends don't ever give me that, like, isn't this great? They're like, oh yeah, that's what you do. You always do, go do some stuff that people read about in books. Were you creative as a little girl? You were growing up in Chicago, right? Yeah, I grew up in Chicago and I, um, you know, I don't know whether, whether I was reading it for or memorizing books at four, but I do remember that I read To Kill a Mockingbird when I was six and I started writing my first novel in first grade. And it was this kind of like legend of she Last of Sheila thing that was a reunion with all of my classmates and on a ship and everybody was like getting raped and murdered. And um, I was writing that for four years. And at that time I, I made, I wrote songs, I painted, I just was creative in every arena. And I had this fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Ford, boy, if I could find her right now. Um, and everybody had been, you know, I, had, I went to a small school, Robert A. Black School, there were 37 kids and we went to school from first to eighth grade. So people were used to getting their little segments of what was happening. So what's gonna happen to me? And they were like little, you know, installments that were being handed out to the class. And at one point she snatched one out of a kid's hand and she was offended by the fact that there was sex and violence in it. 
And that was typewriter time. So there was only one physical copy of this book. And she literally went in front of the class and ripped it to shreds and threw it in one of those big metal garbage cans. And I didn't tell anybody in my family, but I went home and I destroyed everything I had created. And that was kind of the end of writing for me for a very long time. Wow. Because <laughs> because what because what did you feel in that moment? She had shamed me that there was something wrong with me that I could think or write the kind of things that I was writing. So um, I just was like, okay, I that's what comes out of my head. So I guess I better not put that down anymore. Wow. Wow. And then how did you end up performing? How did you find that? I had an elementary school teacher who, um, cause I really got super introverted and super shy and mm. um, they did a lot of musicals. And my teacher at Robert A. Black, he would rent all the costumes for these elementary school productions. And I was cast first as Annie Sullivan and I would not even sing the Mockingbird song. That's how shy I was. I was like, I'll hum it, but I, I won't sing in front of people. Wow. And then the next year I did uh, Golda and Hubble in um, okay. Fiddler. And then I got to play Annie in The King and I. And he got me involved in um, a professional theater program, which was William H. Macy, Stephen Schachter ran the St. Nicholas Theater Company. And I was in class with John Mahoney. He had just come from being, you know, like a, a steel worker or something. And he and I were taking our first professional acting classes together wow. with William H. Macy in Chicago at the St. Nicholas Theater Company, studying Meisner. Wow, okay. That's a lot of names you just dropped. I love that. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good list of cohorts if you're gonna study theater. And did you become determined to take it on professionally? Not really. You know, my teacher was really always encouraging me and telling me about auditions and um, I, was thinking I would be a lawyer or something. And um, I just kept getting offered work. And my mother had struggled so hard to keep a job that getting a job was a huge value to me. And it was something you did not turn down. Like a job was a big deal. So people kept hiring me to do commercials, to do McDonald's ad. And I was the smile for the Coke and a Smile campaign in the 80s. And I did my first professional play at the Goodman Theater, which was um, Greg Mosher directing um, Wole Soyenka's Death in the King's Horseman at the Goodman. And then that went to the Kennedy Center. So I spent my senior year at the Kennedy Center. And then I got into Carnegie and over Christmas break, my teacher said, there's an open call in Chicago for um, this new musical by Hal Prince and Steve Sondheim. I was on my way to Puerto Rico and he's like, no, you've got to, you've got to come and audition. And I'm like, and I did. And Joanna Merlin um, invited me at the end of that open call to come to New York and audition for Hal and Steve. And at the end of that trip to New York over Christmas break, they said, you are going to be in our show, which won't start for another year. So I finished out my year at Carnegie and then came to New York the next fall to do Merrily and we know, you know, the history of Merrily. Yeah, you were but, like, I'm, um, I'm going to Broadway to be in the next big, <laughs> the next big hit. Now, I know I that- I didn't feel that way. I always okay. had this kind of precognitive thing. That's just something I, I just, I always have had it my whole life. Wow. And so mm -hmm. I didn't feel that way about Merrily. Do you find that a lot of actors don't have that <laughs> and get swept up in the possibility of what something can be. And a lot of people are telling you too, you know what I mean? There's yeah. a lot of like energy oh. sort of saying like, this is a thing you have to get really, this is, this is the one, or this is. This is, you know, you got to believe the hype and part of your job as an actor is you got to hype the show. That's part right. of your job is to go out exactly. and sell the show. Um, yeah. I can, I can separate that. Maybe it's the Gemini. I can do my job of hyping something, even if I already have a sense of where that's going. When you look at your Broadway resume, I fell in love with your talents on Broadway. Thank you, Paul. Uh, many that. times, um, multiple times, it keeps happening. You've been able to do a lot of really interesting things. Sometimes when I look at people's resumes, it's sort of the same thing over and over. But if you actually look at that, and I know some of the shows don't run as long as you want them to, um, and 
some of the roles are smaller than other roles, you know, but when you look at the whole scope of it, besides the fact that you got to do, you know, Sondheim and August Wilson, you know, important things like that. And very forward thinking shows. That's what I see when I look at your resume. What do you see when you look at it? I see a choice to be an artist and mm -hmm. to constantly be growing as an artist, as opposed to a choice to be famous and um, just be in hits. So yeah. there have been a lot of hit shows that like I could, I knew it was gonna be a hit and I just was like, I don't really wanna be in that. That's not gonna help me grow. And I often say to my students that it is a choice you get to make when you're gonna have a career and, and it's not a bad choice for anyone, but that, you know, standardization sells. So if you want to be a superstar, you got to do the same thing over and over again, because that's what right. people like about you. And they want to come back and see you do that again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a valid choice. It just was one that I knew as a Gemini, I get bored too easily. So even in the beginning when people would say, oh, my God, I, I listened to the recording of this show you did and I used that to compose for you for this new show, I would be like, but, but this new show is going to be something different. I don't want to repeat right. what I did before. Right. Um, that's definitely not the road to being famous, but it is the road to having interesting relationship and interesting creative opportunities. So yeah. it's something I was conscious that I was doing. I can't skip over Merrily We Roll Along because it is one of my favorite shows. I know it's probably like the shortest Broadway run that you did. Although I previewed, did I preview for, yeah. I mean, no, it previewed actually- for the whole... two months. Previewed yeah. for two months, ran for two weeks. Right. Uh, and then thank I don't know if Holler, if you hear me, might have been about the same. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, I, no, I think it was a little, yeah, maybe overall, maybe overall. Yeah, um, I think they both were the same. Merrily is one of my favorite Sondheim shows. I mean, I just I just love that that music so much. Uh, and the story, like sort of, when I see Merrily, I crumple in a ball at the end and sob mm. and think about all my relationships. And, you know, it's one of those things. And obviously the original concept is that you were all kids. You were all basically teenagers. Telling uh, the that, was the, that was the spin. The that kids spin. spin. <laughs> and th there, there, and there have been many different spins since, including now they're making a movie of it that will literally take, what, 20, 25 years to film? I mean, that, what do you think of that idea? And Ben is in it. We did Caroline on the road together. Oh, that's right. I, yeah, absolutely. Of course. You discovered Ben Platt. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> I discovered Ben Platt. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Good kid. So that show had all those kids in it. And I'm sure a lot of them maybe did not have your Gemini sane thought about how it would run. Tell me about your life the day after that show closed. I mean, you did you move to New York to, to do it? I moved, I moved to New York. I left Carnegie and moved to New York. I had... Um, I had been accepted to Yale and Carnegie, and I deferred my Yale, um, I have deferred my enrollment in Yale because I think I also knew that Carnegie wasn't gonna work out. So I had that option of, of going back to Yale, but I didn't. I just decided I was gonna stick it out in New York, even though I had turned down Juilliard because I never wanted to live in Manhattan, but I decided to stick it out and I started, um, you know, I don't know if you remember this place. It was called the Nodaldini's Chain. It was this restaurant on the east side, cockeyed clams, Nodaldini's, and you could get like a, you know, soup, salad, fish, vegetables, um, all for like five dollars. Oh. The catch was it was like a three-hour wait to get in, and they would have <laughs> you at the bar drinking, drinking, drinking. And oh. I was like, I was like the um the mater d there you know getting my tips and sticking six people on a two top so that they would eat fast and get out <laughs> so that's what i started doing after merrily that was my it, job you, you made it work i started doing regional theater and industrial films but i'm trying to think the next thing i did in new york after merrily i think it might have been just say no with larry kramer and yeah. kathy chalfons and david margulies yeah. Yeah. David S. Bjornsson directing. I think that might have been, you know, it was a real long interval be before I got to do something in New York again. When I became a Broadway journalist, one of the very first stars I got to interview was Gregory Hines during Jelly's Last Jam. And I loved that show so much. I love that production. You were so fantastic in it. Thank Play you. the music for me was like my go-to track on that album. 
I, I, I just, I, that, you know, and fell in love with George C. Wolf and his vision. And that was, that was amazing. And you won a Tony award. Congratulations. Thank many you. years later, that was a special show for me. What was it like for you? And what was Gregory? Yeah. I mean, Gregory Hines was, what was it like to get to do that with him? That was a roller coaster ride show for me. I say that I earned my stripes on that show. I almost and got fired so many times during really? that production. That was the, um, this is, the, I think it's a great story. I, I, George is like one of the most dear people in the world to me in the theater. But I met him when he was still an NYU uh, student, grad school. Mm. And wow. a friend of ours, a mutual friend, said I should consider him to write my first nightclub act, which was going to be at Sweetwaters. Do you remember Sweetwaters on yeah, Amsterdam yeah. Avenue? Uh -huh. yeah. So I did my first nightclub act at Sweetwaters, and George C. Wolf wrote it. And something I said to him at the end of the, before we were getting ready to go into performance, which I thought was kind of a compliment because I hired him on the basis of reading what would become the Colored Museum. Yeah. And I had sort of hoped that there would be some kind of monologues like that in my nightclub act and there weren't. And however I expressed that to him, um, it offended him so much that he did not come see the show and he stopped speaking to me for the next seven years during which he became the George C. Wolf and I could not get arrested, <laughs> okay? And then suddenly he is the head of the public theater. I, you know, I'm not getting seen for anything. And then one day out of the blue, I get an offer, an offer to just come in and replace someone in his Caucasian chalk circle. And that mm -hmm. was our reconnection. And while we were there, he was like, I need you to come to Sue Birkenhead's house and just demo something for me. I didn't, I hadn't read a script. It was a scene. It was a song. I demoed it. I didn't, you know, that's what we did in that period of time. We were always demoing things for people. And then they said, we want to offer you this opportunity to go to Los Angeles and do this new show, Jelly's Last Jam at the Mark Taper. And I was nursing. I had a nine month old, my second child. And the first time I read that script was on the plane flying to wow. LA with my baby. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, this is a woman. I've only played ingenues. This is a woman. Mm. And I had this vision of what I wanted it to be. Didn't know if I knew how to do it. And then when I got to the first rehearsal, I learned that the entire company had been working together for over a year and oh, that the wow. woman who had previously played Anita was now in the chorus, the brilliant Patty Holly. So I walked into a very hostile room, which terrified me. And so all these dreams I had of what I wanted to do in the role, I couldn't, couldn't get myself to, to show it in rehearsal because I was just so mm. nervous that I didn't know what I was doing. And everybody was sneering at me like, you know, why are you bringing her in? And, and I, I kept telling myself, if I could just get to the first run through, then I can show him everything I've been working on at home. But in rehearsal, I just was kind of going through the motions. The night before the first um, rehearse, the first run through, Mary Bond Davis was having her nightclub act um, on Sunset Boulevard. And George didn't tell me this till 10 years later, but he had decided that he was going to fire me the morning before the run through. But he is also a deeply intuitive person. And our cars arrived at the venue for Mary Bond's show at the same time. And he took that as a sign that he should let me do the run through. And at the run through, I did all the things that I had been holding back on. And, you know, and he didn't fire me. <laughs> because your cars arrived at the same time. And then I showed I him what that. I was doing and he was like, oh, I it was, you know, she can act. <laughs> and then when we came to New York to do it with Gregory, that was its own kind of crazy tortured thing. Gregory, you know, consummate performer, yeah. but George was asking something of Gregory that he had never done before. Gregory mm -hmm. had been an entertainer since he was three years old. He had tricks and, you know, if, if anytime anything went wrong in the show, Gregory could do 20 minutes on it and the audience mm -hmm. was in heaven. You know, one night we had a set just collapse on stage 
and Gregory did 20 minutes on it. And so, you know, there was this thing that the audience loved about it. And George was like, you're not Gregory Hines, you're Jelly Roll Morton, and you can't use those tricks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the tension of seeing this guy with a, a career longer than my life at that point, you know, afraid that he was not enough with all of the tricks was its own thing. But, you know, of course he was extraordinary and one of the most amazing people I've ever gotten to perform with because it was improvisational, which is very much the Meisner method. Every mm -hmm. night was alive and fresh and new. And, uh, but it was hard for him. It was scary for him to trust that all of these tools that he had to let them go and just be an actor. You know, he, he really was afraid that he wasn't a good actor. And he mm. told me that whenever he danced and acted in movies, he would always be on acid. That's crazy. So he just never was, wow. And that was a dark character. I mean, Jelly's Last Jam was really exploring some incredible, I mean, uh, and that's, that's the magic of when you, you know, George C. Wolf, and I'm gonna talk about the wild party too, because I'm obsessed. And by the way, Black is a Moocher is like one of my go-to shower songs. Oh, I yes. Do, I, I could do a full Black is a Moocher and I like it like that. <laughs> Can we have I some? Like can, we, can we get I it? I like it like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. That that is my that's my that's my song. Uh, <laughs> if I ever did drag, and I never will, that would be it. Um, <laughs> oh, never say never. Never say never. <laughs> but, I but, see it now. I see you in that black corset. <laughs> Those finger waves. <laughs> but that's sort of the magic of George C. Wolf, the beautiful blend between this powerful storytelling and the, the darkness and then the theatrical magic. You know what I mean? That the mix of all of that is just so intoxicating. I mean, I wish there was always one of those musicals playing. And sometimes we go years without seeing one of those, you know? Well, those are the people, like, I feel like I'm always drawn to the next big thing. Like, all my shows are kind of cult hits. Like, they weren't super successful in right. the moment, but everybody loves them and the people who love them are obsessed with them. Yeah. And The Wild Party was again, one of those shows where he was changing the structure of the musical again yeah. on Broadway. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, when they cast me as Kate, I was like, you know, they gotta rewrite this part and give me more to do because the quote, conflict doesn't start until my character arrives. Right. But Michael John and George were doing something very new. They were like, no, this is not about that three act structure. This is about life in real time. Yeah. And, you know, the theater wasn't ready for that yet. Right. Uh, but it made room for things like Next to Normal and yeah. other shows that would come later. Yeah. Well, I saw it four times during the during the brief run. So I was I was and there. The cast, Eartha oh, Kitt, Michael McElroy, Mary Tink, and Tony Collette. I mean, like. And we have to talk about Caroline Archange, obviously, uh, another beautiful performance that I know you hear about all the time. Uh, just, just incredible. And some of you got to see some of it on TV too, right? On the Tony Awards. When you do incredible work on stage, it is, it does disappear. You know, it doesn't disappear from my mind. I can picture you singing Black as a Moocher. It lives on in my head. But you know, when you do something like on the Tony Awards, it does sort of lives on a different way. Lives on on YouTube in the in the yeah. cloud. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> other generations can find it. But then other generations, you know, you could go online and you can see people all over the world doing it too. You mm -hmm. know, Moliere in the Park, School for Wives. They do 10 performances in a pre-COVID world and the maximum audience they could get if they sold out is 200 people. But online, they have 40,000 global viewers. The yeah. access that this online uh, medium is making for theater to get to more people. And you know what? I just saw Cats here in Seoul. There is nothing like live theater. Seeing things online is never going to change people's love of the live. You know, buying albums hasn't stopped people from wanting to go to concerts. Why there's been this fear that if we film it, no one will come to the theater. It's just not mm -hmm. true. What show did you say you saw? I saw Cats. Did you ever audition for Cats? No, I don't dance. I don't dance. Don't ask me. Grisabella? <laughs> Grisab no, no, Grisabella? Grisabella no. moment? No. No, when Cats came out, Broadway tickets were $25 and the, the hype on that show was so huge that I remember we bought tickets from a scalper and paid $150 a ticket to see it. And it was not $150 a ticket. 
but you got in, you got to see it. I got in and my kids grew up watching the video of it. And it was so exciting to be in a theater again and, and to remember that there's just nothing like seeing performers live on stage. Absolutely. Carolina Change, how do you look back on that run? Like you said, you did it also on the road, right? How, how much of a chunk of your life was that show? Probably around four years because I, you know, I first heard a reading of it, then I went to La Jolla and did Thoroughly Modern Millie on the road. Then right. we came back in the fall, did act one. Then a year later, we came and did act two. Then a year later, we put the two acts together. So it started performing at the public in 2003, Broadway 2004, and then the fall of 2006, 2007 was the National in London. What was it like to live with that woman for all that time? Oh, I love that. I love Caroline. It was the first time that I had a container that was really big enough for me. Yeah. And so, you know, people are always like, that must have been so hard. It's like, no, it's so much harder to try to smash yourself into something that you're too big for. That was like, woo, I just get to be and to express and release every night. It was the perfect, it was just freeing. It was freeing in a way that I've never, ever felt. And it's why I don't do so much theater anymore, because once you've like had wings like that, the thought of like doing something where your wings get clipped, it's not fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. You don't wanna do something at a lesser level. Yeah. It's true. You've been able to tell a lot of great stories on stage, a lot of great black stories. What do you think about the current conversations happening? There's been a lot of discussion about how do we move forward? Obviously it's, it's just it's interesting that the discussions are happening right now because Broadway is also paused. So it's sort of like, once we get back, what are things going to look like? As a leader in this world, where's your head at? I think it's exciting. You know, it's like uh, we only have one thing to change, and that's everything. So I think we're birthing something that we cannot imagine. And to limit it by what we are capable of imagining is too small, playing too mm. small. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. We have to get back to a world that where we are our brother's keepers. And um, the artists in the theater are always the soul and the mirror of a culture. So until we get the theater back, we're missing that voice on our mm. culture. And so I'm excited to see what comes out. And, and I don't want to limit it because I always tell my students, you don't have to make a world like we did before. We didn't do so good. Make something that's never been before. Just dream it up a new way. The lockdown, has been a blessing for me. I know that that's not true for most people, but that's just, it. it I'm a kind of a introverted hermit kind of person. So um, sometimes the world draws too much of my attention and I don't get things done because I'm too outwardly focused. And yeah. so it's been really an opportunity for me to get more creative and to get more focused on what I wanna do with the next last act of my life as an artist. And one of the things about making Red Pill is this realization that I got to make a world. And I'm like, oh no, I, I gotta keep doing that. I gotta keep making worlds and inviting people to come into them and just see possibilities. So I hope that that's been happening for everybody. And what's going to happen is this explosion of, of possibility and of everyone expanding their ideas of who they are. Because everything we say about ourselves is just a story. It's all mm. a story. So I hope we, we get used to throwing away stories and being willing to have a new story today and that stories become as changeable as clothing. I can't wait to see what stories are gonna come out of your mind, Tanya Pinkins. Oh my God, I have so many that are already written that I can't wait. Red Pill is just the beginning. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Well, congratulations and good luck finishing that film. And I can't wait Thank to see you. it. And uh, I hope to see you in person someday soon. Yes, Paul. When, can you imagine that when this is done, people are just going to be like rubbing their bodies on people. It's just going to be like, people are going to run in the park and just like <laughs> grab people and hold them, which is, which is culturally, I was just reading, keep the river on your right. And in this, um, culture in the in the in the amazon these you know this was a cannibalistic culture but that was how they would greet people naked they just a new person comes in they just all just rub up on each other we're gonna go back to that because we're so starved for touch 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 
So we're going to rub up on each other. I'll see you soon and rub up we're on gonna each other. We're going to rub up on each other. We're going to wrap our bodies around each other. I can't wait. Thank you, Paul. Okay.